Hi there. Welcome back to Friendly Ties. Today is an episode about Great Western Trail. A great episode about Great Western Trail. Welcome to the Great Great Western Trail <laughs> episode. <laughs> <laughs> So guys, here we are. Great Western Trail. It's a game. So much Great Western Trail. There's a few of them. So Three games. Great Trail. Three yeah. Great Four Western games. Trails. <laughs> Four games? Four games? Where'd First the fourth edition, one come from? second edition, Argentina, oh New Zealand. So many Whose Great Western idea trails. was it for us to tackle four games at once? Mine. Yeah. yeah I, was <laughs> <say>. <laughs> I like to make things complicated. Yeah, yeah. There, I'm not even sure what our structure is going to be. This is going to be like just talk about a bunch of Great Western Trails. We we happened to play New Zealand and then Argentina, and it was like, let's go for it. Yeah, compare them all. We have like a fun spread of like how much folks have played this game. Like Great Western Trail is probably is the it's the game when people ask me what my favorite board game is, which I hate answering that question. I say Great Western Trail. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I hate answering that question It's the game too. that I've played how a ton of. I'm really good at this game. I, I really love it inside and out. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, there's John, who's a bit more of the skeptic uh, about yeah. the game, has played, I think, across the three games, maybe like, like less than 10 times for all three games or something like yeah, that. Yeah, right? probably around yeah. there. Maybe 12 total right for there. all of them. Yeah. Something like that, yeah. And then Anastasia like lands like right in the middle like in terms of, of both passion and amount of times played, which is great. Mm-hmm. And I'm the newest to it, right? Like I always say about Great Western Trail, it's one of the games I missed. There was a, a couple years there where I kind of fell out of the hobby and Great Western Trail is one of the games that came out during that time period and so by the time i was introduced to it it was already sort of the massive hit that it is so Mm -hmm. i don't think i played great western trail until i think 2021 played it with you nick and so it's just uh so it's fairly recent you know sort of discovering the game and uh, playing the first edition and then having all these other ones come out yeah yeah like almost immediately after that because when when did these come out? I think, I think they all came out in a pretty quick flurry. Uh, like Great yeah, it was like 21, 22, 23. Yeah, I believe it yeah. came out in 2016 or so. And um, then there was an expansion a couple of years later. But like it's been it's been hot right now. Lots of new different versions, which is, I guess, you know, part of the reason why we've been wanting to try all of them. So, yeah, I I guess from like a background, like Nick said, I'm, I'm more of a skeptic. I don't know if skeptic's the right word. I just I, I the game didn't click with me. Um, I made a review for it years and years ago a, a somewhat uh not glowing review overall uh which a lot of people seem to disagree with <laughs> but um I, I did not have that much fun playing it i think i played it like four times and i reviewed it sold my copy and kind of figured i was done with great western trail forever and uh and then the second edition came out and i played that with anastasia and then argentina came out in new zealand and so uh, i guess i will uh give a little bit of a a, a sneak peek that I really enjoy one of these, like surprisingly. Uh, but you know, we'll, we'll get to that later. If it was we just changed, John doesn't like all John's Great Western too. Trail, period, I don't even <laughs> think we'd be doing this episode. <laughs> no, we yeah. wouldn't be. So here we've got four editions to to be discussed. Where do we want to start? I think I want to start just by talking about sort of the the core system of this game, and I think the reason that I really fell in love with the system and. To me, I would say it comes down to like two core parts. One is that hand management in slow motion. Um, you know, the kind of you've got the trail, you want your hand to look something by the end of the trail. And I, I, I really dig that. Um, and then also just sort of the idea of the path itself, that it is developed by the players. It changes the way that you walk along the trail. There are sort of these default action spots that are randomly assigned at the beginning of the game and it's pretty amazing how shuffling seven tiles and placing them out on this almost like single track uh path creates for uh, like very different game plays uh in, in in each of them and that it's it's an impressive amount of variability i think that comes from shuffling seven tiles yeah at a very high level what makes great western trail as a as a as a base game and 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 it if this isn't obvious to everyone listening to this if you're not kind of familiar with great western trail or argentina or new zealand basically 
Great Western Trail is, is the base game. And then Argentina is a different flavor. And New Zealand is a different flavor. Same game, standalone. different flavors. Yeah, standalone. These are not expansions. They are unique games that use the same central core concepts that basically that, that Nick just described. It's a really dynamic system, but it is like, you know, a, a, a sort of punishing game if you're new to it and don't quite know how to get into the rhythm of it. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think especially for people when they're new to it, which I still in some ways sort of am because I never really got into it, um, it's a game that can show itself poorly the first time you play. Uh, the, the very first play of this I did, it was four players. I was super excited about it. I had it shipped from Essenspiel. I didn't go, but I like knew somebody and I organized it. I had one of the first copies of the United States. We sat down and it took us four and a half hours. And it was brutal. And it was just so way, way too long. We were all exhausted. Nobody really enjoyed it. And I was like, well, I got to try it again. That was probably an anomaly. And it definitely is. I'm not here to tell you this is a four-hour game. But if everybody goes really slow because everybody's being cautious and tentative and not racing, the game can take a really long time. Maracaibo, kind of similar. When you have these tracks that are player-driven, like you could go fast or go slow if everyone goes slow, that is definitely a, a factor that can come into play. And then also just trying to figure out the tempo, like trying to understand why you might want to race ahead and, and why you want to work all these things in. And then, you know, on the track, you are building buildings, and many of these buildings are taxation buildings, and they force other people to pay you money. And, of course, you have to pay other people money when you walk over their buildings. So it's like this game where as it goes on, there's there's more and more, like, uh, tension points and kind of mean points like sprinkled around uh, it's a, like a super high level idea of it but like as a new person coming into it i remember those things really sticking out to me yeah the uh the timing thing is is really funny amongst folks that are experienced in this game there's sort of like a running gag almost about the idea that like you tell people you're like oh yeah, yeah i won this game you know with all these really experienced players my winning score was like 65 or something like that and you know you tell that to someone who's played the game a couple of times they're like well i won with like 120 yesterday so yeah. obviously i'm a <laughs> god at this game uh, and it's a reflection of that the game is very responsive to how the players set the pace of the game and you know that's I, this is the exact same thing the first time i played it was the rule book is not great i think the icon iconography definitely requires learning mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it was like it's a it's a long starting teach um everybody was trying to do everything so it ended up being a long game uh, with all of us having these big massive scores and i mean i unlike john had a delightful time and everyone that i played with actually did really like it the first time that we played it um, but it is definitely longer at first and i think one of the things that i i really dig about this system you know is, is you start to learn more about it the next thing people say is like oh you're you really you can't do everything you're really supposed to just specialize and then when you get really good at the game you say well if you just specialize you're probably in trouble. So you need to figure out where you got to dip your fingers in other pies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you do need to specialize usually, but but figuring out like those points of how much am I going to do this or that um, is really cool. And I think one of the things about this game, again, that I like so much is that I think the systems interlock with each other in a really neat way. And as the game design has developed, meaning like going from you know, second edition to Argentina to New Zealand, I think that Fister has just gotten a better sense of like what systems, like how to make the systems interlock with each other even more, which I think is really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should we, should we drill in on like some of the differences, like compare system to system? Yeah. So let's, let's compare a little bit uh, between first edition and second edition. I'm not going to get into every, little like nitty gritty detail of those changes but certainly it's it's the exact same game if you're listening to this and you're debating you know which one am i gonna buy i can find great western trail first edition for 15 dollars versus you know 50 dollars for a new version of second edition or whatever you're fundamentally playing the same game second edition is the better game it's just better balanced they messed around a little bit with the money in the game so what i call taking loans or delivering to kansas city is in first edition was like you do it a bunch because you could just convert that money into points essentially and they made that worse in second edition appropriately but made their other ways to be um, passed to access money 
and largely I would say they buffed the builder strategy in the second edition as well. I think it's interesting uh, that you kind of pointed this out because I think when we were playing um, Great Western Trail right after you taught it to me, you know, I almost immediately I felt like, okay, I was like, that was the first game there. I was like, Nick, I need like training sessions to like mm-hmm. understand this. And you were telling me these like strategies that didn't even feel like complex strategies, but just were like, hey, this is just kind of like general practice. This is what you do. And I was like, interesting whenever i hear that i'm always like do i have to you know but like but it became very clear that like in the first edition you know after your first delivery you need to take a loan right so it was like okay cool that just kind of it was just so valuable to get that early money and i feel like then we went and played second edition and there were was this balancing and there was a little bit more ways to get money and different kind of things in other ways it started to feel like well maybe you don't have to do that yeah, so I, I've played second edition once, um, and the first edition, I think, you know, four or so times, like I said before, and uh, I think a lot of the thoughts that I'm going to have today in this episode, talking about all these comparisons, are going to be more emotional than I normally like to be when, you know, because I love to rip into mechanics and talk about this and that and the other thing, but, um, you know, since this is a system in general that I've largely bounced off of, it's not one that I feel super, like, you know, fluent in all the specific nitty gritty so from an emotional perspective I, I played the second edition once it was with anastasia she like essentially you, you strong armed me into playing it you're like come on you gotta try it again you haven't tried this in like four years and, and and i was like okay sure let's do it we played two player and i did enjoy myself i, I do remember that like again from like a, just a feels perspective i remember yeah. thinking this is a little bit more fun than i remember it being like It still had some frustrating moments that were frustrating in familiar ways from all the years before that I played it. But it did feel like money in particular was less of a frustrating factor. I do remember that in the uh, my first few plays of the original that I was just really bad at getting money. And I think everybody kind of is. And that led to a lot of turns where it was less like which of these great options do I do and more which of these terrible options do I do I uh, do I end up going with? And that's the, the the vibe I remember anyway. Um, so I enjoyed that second edition, but I was also wondering, you know, is it because I'm playing with a great friend and it's a two player game, so it's nice and quick? I'm really not sure, but I think you know Nick saying that uh, in particular the builder strategy maybe got buffed a little bit makes sense to me at least as far as me enjoying things. I can't remember exactly what I did, but I frequently like to go for the builder strategy, and that's because you know this game has two main mechanics it's got lots of mechanics but like it's a deck building game and it's got a customizable rondelle like those are the two big things and i love the idea of a a rondelle that you move across that you can change as the game's going on so i frequently go for builders which are just a a staff you can get and they help you put buildings down and to put a whole bunch of buildings and i i do remember doing this several times with a first edition and being frustrated like not doing very well and feeling like i spent all game building buildings that I didn't even get to use very well and then I lost. And so hearing that second edition maybe makes Builder a little bit more viable, I think just lends into all these kind of overall slightly better vibes, I guess, is what I had from that just one play. Yeah, of of all the Great Western games, the first edition and second edition are certainly the harshest, I would say. And that's going to be something that we're going to talk about when we look into those, those other editions. There, there are more rules in them, but I do think that that this this or the original edition um, or the original game, just Great Western Trail, whether it's first or second edition, is it's it's tax city uh, and the the yeah. tax system in the game is just nastier than it is in the other games, um, and it makes it so that you can get really log jammed in the play. Uh, it is possible that. You know that that isn't going to happen in every single game but if you're playing with folks who kind of have a sense of things it it does often land towards okay what does taxation look like do i have a plan around taxation or where i'm taxing or where i'm moving along the way and you really need a lot of forethought in terms of like what you're putting your buildings that requires a certain level of experience to kind of like brawl with folks you know i think that even a really good gamer playing this game probably the first or second time against people who are experienced in this is going to like 
find like, oh, wow, I really wish a bunch of turns ago I had built this building here instead. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, because now I can't take actions because you threw buildings in front of the way. Or, you know, you guys just have taxed me to death by the time I get to do the thing I want to do. So now I can't really do the thing that I want to do. And I really like that at this point. You know, like it's, 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 I think, a very important tension that exists in the game. But it is important to name that it is the most brutal in this game. And I think in a lot of ways that actually makes the subsequent games more accessible to newer players, even though the games just have more rules. Yeah, I I could not agree with you more on that point. I mean, Nick, how many times have you played Great Western Trail? Let me pull it up on. It's like whatever it says on Board Game Arena plus another 200 games. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I, I'm not exaggerating. This was my COVID game. And I was like yeah. already yeah. kind of in love with this game before. So Board Game Arena says 305, so easily 500 times. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I mean, yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, like we were saying, like, I still remember that play I had with you, John, was like almost a completely different experience of playing Great Western Trail because you'd only played it a handful of times <laughs> and neither one of us built a lot of taxation buildings and yeah. we built up things and it was just like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and 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 that's not saying that, you know, Nick, you play Great Western Trail mean. You just, you play the game the way you, you know, the, 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 the way you know to play it, right? Like, you know, to put things down, to get in each other's way, to create a log jam, to make it easier for you to go. Like, I don't think that the game it's not really a question of is, you know, can you play like nice great Western trail or mean great Western trail? I just think as you get to know the game better, it becomes clear that is the experience. Right. And so it's, how are you going to um, succeed within that? And now we get an opportunity to talk about what they then did with the systems, like how they went and then turned that into like basically two brand new games that stand completely alone and stand alone in a way where like you would be justifiable to have all three games. They are three completely unique games in I your collection. I think you're just saying John... that because you own the three. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I actually don't. I only own two of them. So you get to find that out yeah. at the end. So, I got rid of one of them. Before we go into Argentina, I do actually want to hit on one more thing in second edition because I, I think it's important to set the scene for going into the future editions. I know that Anastasia's least favorite aspect of Great Western Trails, like base base game, we'll call it, is the train system. Um, oh, yes. And I've oh, mentioned God. the integration of systems, <laughs> and there's something Even more than the taxes. Here. Tax right. me, just don't make me, yeah. <laughs> right. It's like the, the trains, you know, they integrate with, like, your deliveries, right? So in theory, like, oh, if you're doing good deliveries, yeah, and you've moved your train, there's a there's like a positive interaction there, or more accurately, there's a negative interaction for not having done it, which is a little bit of an optics problem, but whatever. Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 I maybe shouldn't speak for you, Anastasia, but the, the problem with the trains, and I, I agree with it, is that they're just, they're quite boring. <laughs> yeah. They, you know, the, it has a system where it's like, oh, if you move, and you know other people are in the spot and you move over them like you can actually it's actually one of the few positive interactions in the game where it's like oh i can move over you i get extra move but the problem is that once folks start getting experienced at this game they just move in such a way that the trains don't interact with each other anymore and like i i see really experienced players landing on the like move your train one space and do something else and electing to not move their train wow (laughs) yeah Yeah. that helps you more than me it's it's, it's, exactly it's like that level of like you need to put a certain amount of work into it so if you just say i'm not going to put this work into it this game i have no incentive to like make any of your lives any easier yeah well i mean the train is actually the perfect transition to argentina because it it is the thing that is most improved for me actually the two (laughs) things that i like i like best is in Argentina is what they did with hazards. They turned hazards into granjeros, which is a whole strategy that we're going to talk about. And they, they didn't actually change the fundamental thing I don't like about the train all that much. They just turned it into something that works better for my brain. So in, in base Great Western Trail, if you don't move along the train track, when you go to deliver, you have to basically 
pay a fine because you weren't far enough along the track. In Argentina, you have to pay grain. And if you don't have the grain, you just pay money. So you're, you still have to pay. But you have more what feels like opportunities to get grain that they're going to offset that. So you have more of a choice. It's just it feels more positive to me. Yeah. And I like that so much better. They divorced the train system from the payment system. So there is still payment system, like you said, with the grain, which is, it's, which is I think, the big new addition in Argentina. So I, I do want to come back to that. But the yeah, the trains, they removed the bad optics of you're penalized for not moving and instead yep. said, well, if you've moved the train, now you can leave early. So enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. It essentially, the, there is no penalty for not moving the train. But there's right. a bonus of... It, it it shortens the route like so yeah. that, that, which that's is crazy the perk, right yeah. like the yeah, rondel yeah, yeah. gets potentially optionally shorter for you uh, right. and also here's a bunch of things that could give you money and bonuses uh, as you move along so it's it's just happy fun times train not regret oh i should have moved the train <laughs> exactly be fun times train. so let's okay let's let's summarize i got excited talking about the train and the the lack of of it uh or the the changes to it but let's let's summarize the main changes in argentina so we've got uh we've got grain we've got grand harrows we've got the delivery the new kind of delivery to port situation and then we have your kind of the first time that that cows there's still cows in this game which spoilers there are not cows in new zealand so hang on to your cows <laughs> cows have two types of they they suddenly they have strength they have yeah. another another thing that Dual they purpose. can do so where do we want to start with that yeah i mean we should name also that the grand harrows the shipping the grain are all pretty integrated with each other as yeah. as a system yeah and but you know like like you said they actually did a, a pretty good job of integrating the old systems with the new systems right because builders have cool buildings that help the farming or the grand harrow strategy um or the the grain strategy you know there's there's different builder things that interact with there you've already explained how the train kind of interacts as well although that's a little bit on the weaker side and then you've also explained how the cows have the strength which interacts directly with the grand harrows to me, yeah. I think the Grand Harrow system is the is the most interesting of the new systems. Yeah, that's definitely where we should start. Because uh, as Anastasia said, they replace hazards that were in the original game, which were just things in the way like the game taxed you, essentially. Um, and you could kind of mess people up by putting them in front of people in Argentina. And you could get rid of them by paying a, a large $7, a large amount of money to mm -hmm. remove them. It's to get a couple of points. It. But yeah. in Argentina, they're they're people. Grand Harrows are like ranchers, yeah. and they can tax you. They'll slow you down just like a hazard, or based off the strength we were just saying, you can stop on that spot or go to certain buildings and just take them from the board, much like hazards. And instead of just turning them into points, you could spend a few bucks and and hire them. So it's like a new way to get people. I mean, normally there's one building on the whole rondel where you could spend a pile of money. And hire people. And if for some reason you skip it because it didn't make sense because of the cows you had in your hand, it, it kind of feels bad in that moment. But Argentina brings this whole new element where it's like at pretty much any moment, wherever you are, you could probably find a Grand Harrow and hire them if you have the money. And the Grand Harrows, once you hire them, they make you grain. They make you wheat, which is you know the thing that we will talk more about. But that's like the start of this new system of you need wheat to ship these things. Well... You could get grain other ways. When we played Argentina just a couple of nights ago, I did not hire a single Grand Harrow, and I got some free wheat from various benefits on the train track, but but you two had a lot of Grand Harrows, and you were just <laughs> drowning in wheat, it seemed like, and that is not a problem. Yeah, exactly. And I think you landed on what is, I would say, my favorite part about Argentina of the three systems, that you can employ workers without going to the worker space. Yeah. And that's really cool because, you know, you can get a setup in a game you're just like, oh my God, it's such a slog to get money to get to the end uh -huh. and like buy these guys. So the fact that there's another vehicle for doing that um, just gives you diversity in your like strategic options throughout the game. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes what ostensibly was just a kind of a negative like piece of the game i mean sure you got a couple points if you got rid of hazards or maybe an objective you know that kind of rewarded you for hazards etc cetera, etc cetera. but 
you know, as John loves to say, you know, points are boring. And so there was, you know, hazards weren't all that interesting or they were primarily a negative. You know, you wanted to put them down to slow someone down or to stop people from going a certain way. So they go over your buildings and you would tax them. And again, like, you know, that's, that's part of the fabric of, of the original game. But here it's to me so much more interesting because each, each grand hero has a different amount of strength that it needs to be able to remove it. And there are different spots and there are buildings that you can build that can let you remove them more easily. And there's then beefy cows. You, yeah. And then when you go to buy cows, <laughs> there's some really um, buff beefy cow. cows, some buff cows that are extra strong, but low uh, point value, but then they're extra strong. And so they, uh, so the dynamic of like how much strength you have in your hand, and then you have workers, the workers that you get are also give you strength. And so it becomes you just, it feels like there's lots of ways, you know, to your point, Nick, about how these elements are kind of integrated into the game. There's just lots of ways to kind of build up your strength and then use that strength to hire Grand Heroes and then Grand Heroes give you wheat and, and just kind of control more of that board. You know, you're really, in the first game that Nick and I played, we actually played this twice. We played it back to back, which we don't often do. We finished it. We're like, yeah, let's, let's, let's just do that again. Like, and I think in both of those games, we, we were both kind of intrigued by the Grand Hero elements. And we, we, you know, just, I felt the board free up in so many ways because I was like, okay, cool. We, I want to get, I want to hire these guys, which means that it makes it easier to move around because the hazards, are, you know, you, I, I you, there aren't any hazards because yeah, I've gotten rid the of them, you know, I've hired them for the, exactly. And now they're giving me benefits. And, you know, as a, as a consequence though, is this also the first element of deck building you know, the whole concept of Great Western Trail is, you know, you want to, what did you call it, Nick, at the beginning of this? You said it was slow hand management. Yeah. yeah which isn't deck building, right? I mean, it, I, well, they, they're, it's a little bit. Yeah. It's a little bit, right? Buying cows in, you know, OG Great Western Trail is a certain, it is, it is I guess it is, it's, it is deck building. But this is, for me, is kind of the first element where it starts to kind of make it a little bit more interesting because the cows now have strength. And then when you, use that strength you have to add exhaustion cards which are basically bloat to your deck but then you can get rid of those that exhaustion at the end of the route if it's in your hand so that creates some more interesting choices you're gonna have some deliveries that maybe are like less good because you want to get rid of exhaustion which suddenly makes less good deliveries better better because you're getting rid of exhaustion so again it's just lots of little elements to take away uh, those kind of bad feeling, kind of negative feeling, punishing e feelings that I felt like I had uh, with you know the original game. Well, one subtle element to the strength of the cows and the whole Grand Harrow thing is you know when you use the strength on the cow, you use the cow and you remove it from your hand. So like that goes right. into Nick's slow hand management. It's it's actually another tool. To cycle to kind through of your deck keep... faster. Exactly. And, exactly. And be like, you know, I have a duplicate here. Well, I'll, I'll spend this one for its strength to get a Grand Harrow. Whereas in the original Great Western Trail, especially before the expansion brought in the like draw and discard token, like sometimes you're just desperate to find any way to offload these cows in your hand to cycle through your deck faster. And this is just another subtle way that you can you can really get through that deck faster. Yep. Absolutely. So we did they add the draw and discard tokens in the the Rails to the North expansion to the original Great Western Trail? Or was that just something they added in second edition? It's it's from Rails to the North. And it just, uh, they they liked it so much. They said, okay, this just goes in second edition and all future games of this. And they were right because <laughs> Got it. it is great. Got it. It is great. <laughs> Absolutely. Since we mentioned the deliveries, I think we should talk about the the special deliveries, the sailing or the... What exactly is a quay? What's it's like a, quay? a port? Question mark. <laughs> is it actually called a quay? Is that? I think it's pronounced key, and it always oh. bothers me because it's spelled quay. <laughs> okay, got it. Well, you know what? Now we're derailed, and I need to find out. <laughs> quay. Yeah, it is pronounced key, and is a concrete stone or metal platform lying alongside or projecting into water for loading and unloading ships. So it's a stone dock. Okay, so at the end of Argentina, when you go to deliver, you are delivering at a key, a stone no, dock. No, it's not even that. You deliver at what? a boat, and then the boat goes to the key, and then the oh. key can deliver into the city. <laughs> 
follow that in podcast form. Right? Because when you when you deliver, <laughs> and, and this is my least favorite part of the rules, because I understand why you have to do it from a strategic, but it's so confusing when you read it at first. The first thing you do is you do a special delivery, which you can only do if you have a disc on a key. And the discs arrive at the keys because previously you have delivered to a boat which sails to the appropriate key. And then when you get <laughs> to the delivery action, you can do the shipping or special delivery action, spend some grain and move something from the key, which you had previously seated <laughs> down into the city to get the sweet bonuses. It's, uh, it's kind of complicated. It's a weird loop. Yeah. If you've heard other reviews or people talking about Argentina and they said like, oh, the game is so much more complicated. It's just, it's this piece. It's this, this is the, to me, this is the only really added crazy complexity yeah. or whatever. And it's only because it's not even that complicated. It's just kind of convoluted. It's cut. It's, it's, yeah, it's because of exactly the way yeah. you just said I mean, it. At the start of the game, you don't have, well, I guess you have one up there already during setup. It, it like mechanically, it's actually kind of neat because it's when you deliver, you could get extra benefits from a previous delivery. It's like time travel. Yeah, it's like, and you, you can know, get those. Previous John was like, "Hey, deliver. what's up? Here, here, here's an extra bonus." And you're like, "Oh, thanks, Past John." Um, or you could be like, "Wow, Past John was terrible at this game, and now I have nothing to do." <laughs> 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 Guess which one of those is more likely to happen? <laughs> so there are three cities, each yes. with a key. That are holding your disc. With two keys. Each with two keys. Oh. Uh, no, I take it back. Two of them have two keys. <laughs> one of them has one key. <laughs> <laughs> and the you key know, colors honestly, are gray, just... <laughs> yellow, and yellowish brown. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So there are these three cities. They have a variable amount of, of, of keys. Uh, but, but each one... Oh, my God. I can't believe we're explaining this. Each one has four quadrants, north, east, west, and south. And in each of those quadrants, there is a, a cost to move your disc down into them, but then they, they give you benefits. And there's, a, there's even more timing elements, right? Do you want to take your disc off the key and put it in the city now when you only have a little bit of wheat and get like kind of a, 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 a like kind of infuse your game with like a little more money or a little more wheat or a little bit more something? Or do you want to wait until later and then put it down when you have lots of wheat and you can get, you know, get a, a bunch points. of points. Yeah. And and that adds another, you know, thing to consider, which I think gives the game even more depth and even more interesting paths to play out. But it does create, uh, you know, more choices and then there's just more to parse. I think the other thing about shipping worth mentioning is that, you know, as these ships deliver to the keys those ships will then go away and those are your, the ships also like are options for like what you can deliver like they'll say like this ship requires a delivery of eight and that's that's what it looks like in this game instead and then they bring in two more ships from like the random pile of ships which is interesting and a little weird that like it, you might you know draw some things that say like yeah actually suddenly it's kind of difficult to deliver i hope you picked up some good stuff for delivering um, or you could draw things that are like, now nah, we got your back. Like there's some pretty chill deliveries upcoming as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah. But it can really change things, right? Because if, if you are like, it's, it's since it, since suddenly the delivery row is dynamic and the delivery spots are dynamic at three times during the game, different ships sail away. And, and when they leave, you can't deliver to them anymore. So if you were like, cool, I'm going to deliver seven grain. Oh no, now I can't. And then, you know, to your point, Nick, you know, something comes out and, and, and it can just completely changes that dynamic. But I also think that's really fun because instead of just like this, this, this track at the top with everything kind of being the same and, oh, I, I can't deliver at this spot anymore because I already delivered there. So I have to do that. It's just, it's, it's a completely different kind of layout. And then the timing too is another reason to kind of change your thinking about how you do your loop because you're like oh no i need to make sure i get on the ship before it sails off to that key and so i better go faster you it's, know it's whatever. another consequential mean part of the game it's a, it's a new mean part of the game uh it, both times i played argentina there was a crucial moment where i was going to deliver on my next turn and somebody delivered before i could and made the ship i needed sail away and, uh, you know, I should have seen that coming. I could have planned around it, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But, like, 
it didn't change the fact that in that moment I felt kind of dumb and annoyed <laughs> like like dumb because i didn't see that that was even an option not like oh i hope they don't do it it's more like i just have all these things i have all these things and then wait a minute what do you mean the boat's floating away <laughs> and then you know out you know the seven floats away and out pops a three and you're like okay well i guess i delivered to a three here we go or worst case you know the seven floats away and a nine comes out which in case you have to deliver to the zero or something like that and uh some people are really going to like that. I, for my personal experience, I've found it frustrating. Like I respect it as a mechanic, but as a player of the game, it has annoyed me a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm actually with you. I think this game asks you to pay a lot more attention to that the timing component than any other game for the deliveries. And like you know, you call it as like a, a mean action, John. But the thing is that a lot of times players are are not even making their choices based on these ships will sail because they don't know how good your hand is. Yeah. So it's like true. you got hosed and like no one was trying to like the, the game just kind of went there. It just has more points of these like timed triggers and you know, you can't necessarily anticipate looking at someone else's position like, Oh, they're going to deliver now because their hand is perfect for it versus like stopping in over at this thing. I think that it's, it's like the game requires it to like make that system work, but I don't love what it does for the like the having to pay attention part of it of, of it. So s- continuing this journey, right? So we've talked about kind of, you know, like just to keep kind of sailing forward, if you will, uh right on over to New Zealand. <laughs> uh and <laughs> Which also has sailing, but extremely different sailing. Yes. Extremely different. <laughs> Much better boats better boats let's talk about let's talk about new zealand because you know while argentina takes in my opinion takes the base game and then kind of adds in these kind of additional layers that integrate very beautifully uh new zealand also beautiful but in a completely different way i think new zealand is a completely different game but uh let's talk about why it's it's certainly the most ambitious game why do you say that Oh, I just think that they hit the most systems have been added. Like if we want to enumerate sort of the big changes, it's it's that trains are now sailing and sailing yep. is much more complex. We can dive into that. Removing hazards now, there, there's essentially now more of a deck building component. You put things in your deck that give you rewards as you cycle through and those yep. are tied in with the hazards. And then they have like a couple extra tracks and other little bonuses here and there. It's just it's just the most ambitious because it puts it puts the most stuff into the game. Um, and uh, I completely neglected to say probably the most the biggest change, which is the shearing system. Yeah. yeah. Well, and in addition <laughs> to that, the bonus action tiles we talked about in the last game, how oh, yeah. you know you could only <laughs> hire people. You know that, that that Argentina added this idea that you could hire you know you could hire the Grand Heroes. So you had another way of hiring people. Now there are a whole there's a whole separate system of hiring and and in addition to that there's a whole pathfinder track which changes where on the board you can build and how you can and and just as another way to get points i mean yeah. that, that's ambitious uh, <laughs> ambitious ambitious, ambitious. <laughs> it does and that i think barely captures you know everything that is at play here it, there is just so much more available to you uh and it's just really fun <laughs> <laughs> I think the first thing I'd like to highlight is not it's not necessarily an addition it's like one of the biggest it was there in the previous games but now it's different and that is the yeah. the, the timing track like Great Western Trail every game up to this point you know every time you deliver you put tokens onto the board and you in particular put people onto a track that you can hire and as you put people onto that track it pushes the game towards its end and New Zealand cuts that whole thing in two. And now when you put people onto this track, it's not actually a track. The people just go into a hiring market, which is completely separate. And the timing track is what you briefly alluded to. It's all these bonus tokens, tons of different bonus tokens with a ton of different benefits. And that is what pushes the game along. So the game clock still moves based off of deliveries. That hasn't necessarily changed. But what has changed is divorcing hiring the the basic people from that and uh right at the beginning i i I really like this because in the original well in all of the games up to this point the cost to hire people fluctuates as the game goes on 
to me, as somebody who's new to the system, it fluctuates arbitrarily. There, there's probably some greater intelligence to why they go the way they do, <laughs> but it's just, you know, you put it in this row, it costs eight, put it in that row, it costs five, put it in the next row, it costs seven. It's just all over the place. Um, and in New Zealand instead, they go into a market where the more of them there are, the cheaper it is. It's, it's like an actual supply and demand type of situation, which I just, I mean, like from a mechanical perspective, not even from a, like a, a feels when I'm playing perspective, just like game design, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> supply it's and demand so much more me- intuitive. It's so much more intuitive, 100%. Yeah, there's yeah. no question yeah. about it, yeah. Yeah, and the older systems with the like, ah, oh, it's six, and now it's seven, and now it's five. I I agree with fully. It's completely arbitrary. It's there just to be a game mechanism that you pay attention to and get little edges in. And this one, it really is like, yeah, if you want to drill up that specific worker track, it's going to start costing you a couple extra bucks. Yeah, or maybe yeah. nobody seems to be doing it, and you're like, well, I guess I'll be the you know sharing person or whatever because they're exactly, getting pretty darn cheap to hire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is good, right? Because the, the really, from a strategy perspective, you you don't want to bump too many heads with people when it comes to hiring in this game. So the, the game now tells you, yeah, 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 try to like get out of other people's lane and focus on this. Like, I, I, I like that. I think that it's it's yeah. very helpful for it. The game design tells you a little bit more about like where you could put your efforts and and be rewarded for doing so. So there's also bonuses. Um, Like I said, that's the kind of the new thing that's the game clock. And I'm going to tip my hand a little bit and say that this is one of the things I really like about this game. And it wasn't obvious to me at first. And I've been thinking about this a lot when I knew that we were going to be filming this episode. And I realized, so the bonuses, you can get them in many different spots, just the natural buildings, the neutral buildings on the board. Um, I think a couple of them give you an opportunity to buy bonuses. And some bonuses give you a wild worker I'd like they cost a little bit more money but hey that lets you hire even though it's not a hiring spot or maybe it gets you a dog a dog card that you put right into your deck that's going to be great every time you draw it or bird card or or maybe a new sheep there's there's a whole separate type of sheep that you can't even get in the standard market in the standard way you can only get it through various bonuses and so that's a long way of saying when you go to a spot to buy a bonus it lets you dabble in a bunch of different systems, Um, like in particular hiring and deck building, but also just other bonuses like get some victory point uh, acquiring and also just like getting money and just uh, maybe not getting money, but just from memory, it's just it's just like a buffet of really uh, varied options that are reasonably priced for the most part. And you can access them from many different spots. And so I liked that flexibility to to dabble, to, to say, well, I think I'm going to be going, well, I like, for example, the last time I played, I went heavy into Shearing Sheep, which we will talk about very soon. But this let me do quite a bit of deck building, even though I actually didn't actually hire that many sheep or hire, <laughs> buy that many sheep in the standard <laughs> way. But it let me lean in one direction while I also, you know, Nick said earlier that if you go really hard on one specific strategy that... um that is going to be good if you're in the mid tiers. And then if you get really good at the game, you realize you have to start like sticking your fingers in different other parts of the game uh, to also get those benefits. And it seems like New Zealand makes that so much easier to do right from the get go. Absolutely. I think New Zealand is talking about, you know, where we started, you know, tonight was, you know, this idea of like wanting to go around and push buttons, you know, kind of regardless of, you know, just, just having that, that feeling of exploring the game. I think, I can see myself now. I've played New Zealand at this point like seven times, Whoa. maybe eight times. That's way more than yeah. I realized. Yeah, well, we've played it. How Anastasia many Anastasia and I have played two player quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, we have. Yeah, I played it twice. Yeah. Uh, three player with Anastasia twice, actually. Yeah. It's, it, it, you know, it's always fun to find a game like this that, you know, even if you haven't played it and beat and you're just like, hey, you get together, and you're like, hey, you want to just play something? Like, what do you want to play? Oh, yeah, let's just play New Zealand, right? Like we just, we know the experience we're going to have and and we know the game already. And it's just, it's it's a fun time to sit down and explore it and and and, and push those buttons. That's that's kind of my point. Like, you know, playing this game seven or eight times, I every time I feel like I get to go touch something new, right? Which is a different experience than, you know, you know, where we started this, which, you know, with, you know, OG, Great Western Trail, which is a game where I feel like, you know, I'm just I'm just trying to figure it out so that I can 
can kind of play it better and kind of, you know, not, you know, kind of get, get into the rhythm of the game. But, you know, I want to go back to what you said, John, about the, 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 just to kind of highlight my favorite part of the game, which is, which is that deck building. Like Mm -hmm. not only do the bonus tiles give you these cards, but Nick, you brought up the idea of like hazards turning into cards. And, and, and and, like, I I honestly, when you're talking was like, are there hazards in New Zealand? (laughs) Because that's how like, like neutered frankly they are in this game like i'm not saying they're not there and i'm not saying they don't kind of dictate things but there are so many other things that are dictating them speaking of like negative versus positive interaction you know you've got this this pathfinder track that like like is basically blocking spots and then you kind of you know you can the further you go the more pathfinding you do you could open up new paths and then you know you that moves you you get different cards that give you bird points and bird points move on the bat like all these different kind of things that kind of just open the game up and with the deck building you sure you're adding lots of things to your deck but almost all the things you're adding are positive things and a lot of the cards are basically like uh draw and immediately discard draw and get a benefit and discard to the yeah. point where like I, I think in our three player game john there was one point where like I just, I needed to like refill my hand and I drew like four cards in a row that were like draw and discard to the point that I like went, I was just like, I had like no money. And then suddenly I'm like, draw, discard, draw, discard, draw, discard. I I was like, I was like flush. Like I was like, let's go. Like I was just, it's such a satisfying feeling to have that much control. That's why I, I can't call the first two. They are deck builders, but this one is truly a deck building game like it really feels like or i I really we should call it like a deck bloating game because it's really hard to get rid of cards but you really are just creating a deck that that is such a central mechanism to the way that you actually interact with the game not just you know i'm slowly doing hand management to deliver at the end i mean they don't bloat the deck that that's that's the key thing that i love about i guess you're right that element of new zealand it's just like sure get more cards who cares like you, you draw them, they give you a thing, they immediately go away. Those dogs, they give you certifications. Awesome. Those are great. The fairy gives you money. Awesome. Keep drawing until you have a handful of sheep. Um, I, I just really like that. I, instead of being like, are you sure you want to put another card in your deck? Maybe it's getting a little inefficient. It's like, put as many dogs in this deck as you can. <laughs> yeah, strictly strictly positive deck bloat. But we yeah. do need to coin deck bloating and then design a game around it because I feel like that will, <laughs> yeah. that will take off for sure. Um, yeah there's a couple things that you guys mentioned in there that i I want to touch on a a while ago john you used the word dabble and anastasia you talked about touching all the buttons in this game and i just want to echo that so much you know we said that this game is more ambitious there's a lot more going on in it but i think in part because it has more going on in it it lets you touch more of the systems um and that is i think it's it's greatest strength is that it really lets you touch a lot more of the systems um in a way that, that that can feel really good the other thing is is I want to talk about the hazards because yeah. you know after we played the most recent game of Argentina, John was like, ah, I just felt like the taxation was really bad, and I was like, buddy, let's go back and play GWT two E. <laughs> you don't see what it looks like. <laughs> you know, walk uphill pain. both ways in the snow in the <laughs> yeah, original. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was like, be grateful. I, I feel like New Zealand can't be that much less because of the way the board is laid out. And then I went and looked at it, and it's like, yeah, they actually hazards come out at a less high frequency than they do in the other games. So yes, folks, there's still the tax chase in the system and folks can still put tax buildings in the way and there's a couple of things you're gonna do, but probably you'll pay a little bit less in taxes in this game compared to the other ones for sure. And if you hate that you're doing that, you can just jam up Pathfinder track and say, I'm immune to taxes henceforth. Yeah. Screw this. I'm done with I it. Know. It has a whole element of <laughs> that. Ignore exactly. taxation you entirely. Just ignore taxation if you go. <laughs> and on top of that, when you take the hazards in the previous games, not talking about Grand Heroes, they're just victory points. They, you know, maybe match up with your objectives, whatever. In this game, when you take a rock hazard, you get a dog, like I talked about before. And when you take a water hazard, you get a fairy, like I talked about before. And both of these things turn into money. And that means you're deck building while you are removing hazards instead of just getting points. And I think those things also just kind of give you points as well. It just, it doesn't feel as bad. Yeah. 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 And it just means that money, like I was saying about being flesh and money, it just means there's so many more ways to get money. So, you know, if you, you know, going on the the great journey of Great Western Trail that we've been on tonight, you know, when we started this podcast, we talked about how 
poor you are and how little money you have and how hard it is to get money, how like even in first edition, you have to take a loan, it, it, you know, if you want to have money to survive the rest of the game. And here it's like, hey, cool. Money, 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 money comes from just everywhere. Flexibility, and it, flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all over the place. And that's primarily due to that element of the deck building, right? Like it's primarily due to that, to the bonus tiles and the last piece that we haven't really talked well, uh, cool, the two pieces, shearing and shipping. So shearing is very uh, pick lucrative. your poison. That's <laughs> Let's t- tell us about shearing, John. So in uh, Argentina, we had beefy, strong cows all over the place, like two things. They have delivery strength and they had regular strength, right? And in New Zealand, they're sheep with shearing values. And it's fluffy, a similar, beautiful sheep. Fluffy, beautiful, fluffy, beautiful yes. Sheep. But it's a similar kind of um, uh, decision. Like there are sheep that are terrible when you deliver them at the end of the route, but they have so much freaking wool. <laughs> and there's the, the inverts were like just amazing <laughs> sheep to cash in, but don't even bother shearing them. And that gives you another element to the game. There's a new type of person that you can hire. They are a shearer or something along those lines. And there's a new action spot on one of the neutral buildings that lets you shear your sheep. And this is functionally another delivery in the middle of the route. It's a little bit different, but for the most part, you are cashing in your sheep. Um, You're limited by the number of shearing people you have, so in that way it's a little bit different, but you still need different types of sheep. If you shear enough sheep of a collective value that's good enough, you could also put discs on the board, just like you had delivered, and you get money for the shearing. So, And of course, you could just ignore this and just do all the other systems, and I think do very fine. I didn't shear at all the first time I played this game, and I think I won. Well, I did well anyway. Let's just put it that way. The, this like double delivery system of like shearing and then that your genuine kind of old school delivery, I think is is another one of the greatest strengths of this game. You know, going fastest is not always the best, but it does often mean that you can deliver the most. And if you can't deliver the most, you're probably getting more money. So like, it's probably good. A lot, you, there's, I think there's probably a correlation between number of deliveries and victory in the other games. But in this one, because you have a double delivery system, it's actually a lot more viable to like play slow, touch more of the systems and not feel like, oh, I'm falling behind the other players, which is cool. Yeah. Really cool. One other point, not to belabor it too much about sharing, uh, is to go back to the idea of deck cycling. Uh, I talked about this uh, some with Argentina, like, oh, you know, you get Grand Harrows and you spend the strength on the cows and that lets you get through your deck faster. The same thing happens here with the shearing, especially if you are leaning hard into it. And the last time we played, I think I went through my deck like six or seven times. And that was, it felt like a deck builder in a way that I've never seen with any other great Western Trail games. If I'm just going off my memory, I mean, Nick's played 500 games, he's got better anecdotes, but I vaguely <laughs> remember going through my deck like twice in a whole game of the original Great Western Trail. And that really frustrated me. I remember that was one of my cons uh, when I reviewed the game was like, it just felt like, yeah, you're deck building, but it felt so slow. It didn't almost even really feel like it. Whereas in New Zealand, I just I felt like I was constantly reshuffling my deck because of all these things, you know, the cards that auto draw into new things and two deliveries that let you get rid of, you know, obviously you're shearing the high shear value, low delivery value sheep, and that means you get them out of your hand and you're more likely to draw the high value sheep that you have, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, you can really race through it. And that's part of the fun of deck builders is going through your deck many times. Yeah, for sure. Should we talk sailing? Yes, please. So sailing is the new train system. And, you know, at its core, it does a lot of the same things. It's just you move a thing somewhere, and when you when you stop somewhere, you, you can get a little bonus. The thing that this does better than the other systems, than the old train systems, is it says, well, there's some branching paths here. And it looks intimidating at first, but it's actually pretty straightforward. And you just go to places, and you can get the same rewards as before. But now you can also get little perks if you decide to stop in here and drop just a couple dollars. So there's so many more little things you can do, so many more like efficiencies. And like it feels a lot more satisfying to kind of plot out what you want your shipping journey to look like with more kind of rewards along the way. The last thing that I'll say about it that I think is greatly improved is you are, I think, sufficiently rewarded for doing this system even just a little bit yeah. uh, because it opens up a few options, a few delivery options that are not available to you until you've gone and stopped at them. And it's not crazy hard to go get those things. 
but if you neglect to do them you know it, it can make it like a, a just sheep you know uh, shepherd strategy be a little bit difficult so the game encourages you to get into the into that system a little bit just a little bit yeah i think in my last play i moved my boat twice in that 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 access to I also had a card that let me put houses down nearby. But yeah, I, I totally agree. I barely needed to move the boat in order to be viable there. It, it makes me kind of want to play a heavy shipping strategy. I haven't done that yet. Oh my God. I have done that in many like games. Every game. And <laughs> <laughs> like constantly. Every time I'm like, I might sail this game. And Anastasia's like, and I'm going to buy the sailors. <laughs> i think we literally played a game where i was like the i was like i'm not gonna, I, the only thing i don't want to do this game is sail and then the next thing i did was go like sail everywhere after i bought a sailor too i but. know <laughs> don't ever trust me this is the number one rule don't trust me when we play games um i have vastly enjoyed this element so you know we talked about the railroad and the other games and how I, I, I haven't enjoyed that uh, as a mechanic. And, and you know, the truth is when I play conductors in the original game, I, I actually don't mind it. I mean, I like going along and I like the benefits that you get. My biggest problem with the railroad is that you, and this is actually a thing that has always kind of frustrated me with great Western trail, just, you know, as a system is that you, you hire workers. And then if you go and use the railroad, you have to leave those workers behind as station masters. So here you've you've gotten them, and then you're going to get rid of them. But they're so expensive. And then when you, they're so hard to get. They are so exactly. They are so expensive, and then you get rid of them, and then they don't work for you anymore. So it's you know you're building up an engine and then immediately tearing it down. And I just I find that to be really difficult. So here we are when we're sailing, and. What excites me about that is that, to, as you said, Nick, you have divergent paths. You get to choose where you get to go. And there are lots of opportunities in sailing that don't require you to leave behind people. There are still options to leave behind people, but there are lots of opportunities where you don't. And you have a whole special new track on your board of houses that you get to leave behind. And those houses, again, give you little benefits and little perks and little things and little permanent things or points. And, and, I just, I love that. Yeah, it's a really great subsystem. I do want to talk about briefly a uh, system, the system that I don't like in New Zealand, which is the the gold. I know that you guys don't agree with me on this. Oh. And I see why it's in the game. But to me, it's a, it's it just stands out as a sore thumb, as this like extra resource that, you know, it, it touches the bonus tiles. And the bonus tiles are clearly like, designed and then i feel like the designer was like all right this bonus tile is kind of weak so i'll give some bonus gold on it and this bonus tile is pretty sweet so it'll cost some gold and then you can also use gold to like get these cards to go into your deck and that part's cool because i like the deck building part of the game but i just i just don't love this little like extra track that like only touches these like extra parts of the game that has like nothing to do with any of the rest of the design of the game. It's, it's the thing that bothers me most. <laughs> I totally disagree with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, <know. laughs> no, I mean, okay, but Nick, sure. It does, but, but it does still kind of touch the rest of the game because you specifically have to use gold to be able to hire that wild worker out of the bonus tiles. So it, it does make it a little bit more difficult to be able to hire the wild worker, which is ostensibly a very powerful worker. But in addition to that, the cards that you can buy with gold are different from game to game. And I think that that is so fun. And you don't, you don't just get them from gold. You can also get them from sailing and from, you know, some different opportunities that, uh, you know, are provided to you, but still those it's four types of cards and those change. And there's a whole bunch of them that are possible. And I think that's what makes gold so much more interesting to me. It's just, just another thing. It's not an action that you have to take. It's not a turn. It's just, it's like, cool. Speaking of timing and bringing more elements, you know, kind of finding new ways to play with that it's like do you want to spend your gold now on this one card or do you kind of want to wait or do you need to keep it around so that you have some gold to get a bonus worker i like it yeah i'm more on the anastasia side of the gold thing than the nick i i, I get where nick's coming from but i i really do like the decision point of when do you spend it um 
on those bonuses, but also the bonus action to, to do the deck building. There were many times in our last play where I had, um, you know, something like three gold, and that meant I could take X card. But Y card would cost four gold. And I like Y card better, but I'm about to reshuffle my deck. So do I spend three gold right now to take the card that's pretty good and get it into my deck for a whole extra cycle, or do I hold out to get the better card that I like to actually use it less? Like, those kind of things... I, I do find to be kind of interesting. But, I mean, it's a game with systems and systems. And I tell you what, setting this game up is a beast. <laughs> I mean, th- th- this is the point where I'll, like, I mean, if anyone's paying attention, obviously this is the one that I really enjoyed. But um, I've been thinking about this a decent amount, especially after we played Argentina two nights ago, and I was pretty darn frustrated at the play. And I was just like, why don't I enjoy the non-New Zealand games that much? And there's a few reasons, and I'm not going to go into all of them right now, but one of them is... A uh, discontinuity that I have with the design goal of the game. I see a rondelle that's customizable, and I want to customize it. And it frustrates me when I go on a shearing uh, strategy and maybe do deck building, and I don't have time to place buildings on the board because you only have so much time to do everything. Maybe I do one or two buildings. And then, like, the board is so static. All it does is get more clogged with your buildings that just slow me down and cost me money. That just frustrates me, and it kind of bores me like the, the specifically the rondelle bores me because it seems like it's as good as it's going to be at the beginning of the game and it only gets worse unless i spend most of my effort in the game constructing buildings and in new zealand i could <laughs> not put a single building down and halfway through the game all of the neutral buildings flip over they all are different and i love that like that that kind of makes me feel like uh, it makes me feel seen <laughs> <laughs> like some people, you know, w- want that variety. They, they want it to be shaken up. And I'm not even saying they necessarily get better. I'm not even sure if they do. I've only played the game twice. But um, I remember last time we played, it was like, oh, we flipped the buildings over. And I was like, yay! <laughs> like, what, what, what new <laughs> options do we have available? So I, it seems like it, it's, it's a bit of a band aid. Like, it doesn't completely fix my personal, uh, not even problem with the game. I think I just wish the Great Western Trail games as a core had a different design ethos when it comes to the buildings, but it's a pretty good Band-Aid. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So while New Zealand, in my opinion, is the most fun, like if I was going to say one word, and I've used it multiple times tonight, about all of the Great Western Trails, it's just dynamic because I think that's what I love about all of these games and what I think that this just like went and, and just like, you know, cranked it up to 10 you know in New Zealand it's just like so many different pieces that are so dynamic but the downside of all of that and I think that this is important if you don't already understand that system which took me many games to kind of understand and then you go into New Zealand there is there is so much to learn there is so much overhead I think if you're if you're in for the game and and ready to take that on I think it is the better experience. I think it is it is so much fun. It is going to be a game that is going to it, it, it's just it is the most enjoyable Great Western Trail. And I think m- less people are going to bounce off the game immediately than they might with the original game because of a lot of the frustrations and suffering that we've talked about. But I'm daunted and I'm really curious to hear what you guys think about this. I'm daunted to teach Great Western Trail New Zealand to a brand new player because of just all of the different systems and all of the things to think about that are on top of that's a good point kind of understanding the base the base system. Yeah, I think it's a I think it's a problem that the game just has and I don't think has a solution. It is strategically the friendliest, most accessible game. It is mechanically the biggest. Yeah. And I, I, there's just no fixing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you've said, I've heard you say, Nick, that you you would teach people New Zealand first. I would teach serious gamers New Zealand first. Mm. So to, to clarify, right, like I would teach John New Zealand because I know that he's going to be able to pick up a game and all of its systems. Um, yeah. So if, if someone is like, oh, yeah, I play, I play all sorts of stuff. I love Agricola. I've played it 300 times. I haven't played any of the Great Western Trails, though. Um, I would happily show them New Zealand first. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. It's pretty obvious. New Zealand is is essentially the only Great Western Trail I'm interested in playing. And I am interested in playing it more. Honestly, this conversation has kind of hyped me on it. And I'm like, 
yeah let's do it again but yeah let's but, go but where where are you two i i like all of them and unsurprisingly i'm a big fan but uh argentina is growing on me um it's definitely my least favorite of the three i think really? part of it is that i felt like it was it, it feels like it's it's just an expansion and i'm not generally an expansion person for games it's it's fine it like it like adds some stuff that i like and some stuff that i'm lukewarm on and i i for me it doesn't like do enough but it also like has the challenge of needing to do more i've liked it more as we've played it particularly as i've kind of seen how the grand heroes integrate sort of with the rest of the game that has that has definitely like kind of upped my my valuation of 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 um the game there the tough thing for me is between new zealand and great western trail second edition i think i I said it at the beginning of this podcast great western trail second edition is the it's the game that i tell people is my favorite game when they force me to answer that question uh i have just i've played it so many times i really think that the game has so much depth um it's very nicely tuned the amount of randomness in the game is a very good level for for what i'm looking for in a game and yeah i mean i could just go on about how much i really appreciate the game but i'm just i'm so like (laughs) personally invested at this point in like my experience of having played gwt so many times that it like almost has to come out on top but new zealand is really cool um i think that you know like I, it's it's maybe a a bridge a little too far uh in terms of like the extra systems that get added in but i when i played it and and as we've been playing it i've been delighted at how refreshing it made the entire great western experience for me i'm not tired of this game you don't play something 500 times and you're like okay well it's it's been it's been tiring me out now you know like it's like i could play 501 is just too many (laughs) too many right but but new zealand really really felt like a fresh breath of air whereas argentina was like yeah yeah this is kind of the same but it's not the game that i love um whereas like with new zealand it's like oh cool like i put these dogs in my deck and i am thinking about these things and the sailing system is really fun and so getting to like mess around with all that stuff and uh, now i'm evaluating these bonus tiles and how much do i want to buy these and you know at the end of a game of new zealand you like dismantle your deck even if you weren't playing a shepherd strategy and you're like man i got a freaking 23 card deck here with like (laughs) all these different multicolored sheep and uh, one of the sheep looks really saucy like you know it's just <laughs> it's it's just it's a great it's it's just a really great game I, I i really like it as an evolution in in the series yeah i mean i i think i fall right right in between you guys so we played the first edition in 2021 and up to that point it was really unlike any game that I'd ever seen kind of do this. And of course I'm coming to the game like a couple years late coming into the game late. I actually felt like I, it was never going to get enough plays of it to really ever be good at it. And I, you were too far behind. I I was too far behind and I don't often feel that with games. Like, of course, like a game is an experience, but there's something about this game and maybe it was playing with you, Nick, but like there's something about it where I just felt like to really master it, I, I would just never, I would just never get enough, you know, opportunity or to, you know, to catch up, to kind of feel like I could really compete. And then the second edition came out and then Argentina and New Zealand came out and I was like, oh my gosh, here's my opportunity to play the game again, to experience it again. And honestly, like a level playing field and I don't that I need to win or anything, but that, that I now could experience Great Western Trail with Nick, who loves the game so much, but brand new, like we could explore it together. It it's wasn't 2016 about all over again, right? Exactly, yeah. that I could be a part of it as it is, and just experience these new systems. And I, I don't know, there's just something about this that 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 just got me so excited. And I've just had so much fun over these last couple of months getting a chance to like push all the buttons again and be part of that of that experience. Yeah, Argentina and New Zealand were we yeah we learned them together like straight up. You know, I said that I I own two of these now, right? So uh, for me, 
uh, Great Western Trail Argentina replaced Great Western Trail for me. Everything that I still like about the original Great Western Trail, frankly, as compared to the New Zealand experience, <laughs> is 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 present in Great Western Trail Argentina and and just does it better and more interestingly for me personally. And I and I, and I think that that's because it takes all of the kind of like sharp edges that I didn't like about the original game and and just turns them into more interesting fun things for me to explore while still having a game that feels at its core very much like the original system it's still very clearly the original system it's still um that that's the game i want to show off if i want to show off the great western trail system if i want to say like look at this cool loop and the dynamic you know player driven you know pacing and all of that i want to play argentina to kind of show that off and new zealand is just in its own right just such a fun game i mean if if you sat me down and said which one is your favorite which if you can only keep one i i would keep new zealand i you know i do think it's the best of the three and that's because i think it's just as a game experience just you know nick you said you know it's delightful it's delightful and i really enjoy it and i and i want to keep going back to it if you bounced hard like John off of, you know, the original game, I, I Argentina clearly, you know, John has said did did not did not fix it for him, if you will, but New Zealand did. So I think New Zealand is an opportunity to bring people back to Great Western Trail who who maybe didn't, you know, kind of just jive with the first system, but Argentina I think is for is perfect for someone like me who who was really impressed by the original game and the original system but just was like, gosh, this it's this punishing or I just don't feel like I'm ever going to master it in the way that, you know, like everyone else has, or I just, I, I don't even know if I want to master it. And then I get to go play Argentina and I get to like, just play with that same system, but with just like so much more fun little pieces that I, that I can kind of play with and, you know, we can, can poke these buttons and then New Zealand's over here just to, just to go have a, a, a crazy good time with. That is going to bring this one to a close. And if you have any thoughts, and I hope people have thoughts, like we've had so many thoughts about these, please leave a comment on the YouTube version of this episode. You can find a link to it in the description. We'd really love to hear what you have to say. Like, how do you rank all of these games and whatnot? Please leave a comment over there. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks, everyone. Bye.